All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our first lecture. So here we're going to cover intro to hardware and also an introduction to programming. Okay, so goals for today. So we'll first talk about kind of the main parts of computers and their functions and why we bother to learn C++. Really, the importance of programming languages and why we choose C++ instead of some of the others. We're also going to talk about important tools programmers use, such as IDEs and repositories. And we'll also talk about the main advantages of C++ and object-oriented programming. So let's start with a random fact. So in Japanese, there is this word kuchisabishi. And literally, it means lonely mouth in Japanese. And it's interesting because there's no equivalent word for kuchisabishi in English. Kuchisabishi describes eating when you're not hungry, but because your mouth is lonely. And so kind of like when you're feeling snacky or peckish, you're just kind of bored and you want to eat a snack. And the reason I bring up kuchisabishi is because some languages have unique words that say things more efficiently. So where does programming come in? Well, the same is true for programming languages. Some languages say certain things more efficiently than others. And it turns out that people invent new programming languages and improve on existing ones in order to say stuff and do stuff more efficiently. So it's not that one language is necessarily always better than another. It's about using the right programming language for the job. So as a computer programmer or engineer, you will want to use the right language for the program that you're trying to write. So why do we choose to study C++ in this class? Well, there's several advantages of C++. First, C++ is fast. And it has also been around a long time and lots of people still use it. Also, if you take more advanced programming courses, such as data structures, you're probably going to need C++ in those more advanced courses. Later on in the course, we're gonna learn that C++ allows us to manage memory efficiently. It has tools such as pointers built in that will help us manage memory directly. Not all languages have that. Also, C++ has features that enable object-oriented programming to be easier. And so most, but not all, languages have that capability. And finally, C++ requires use of a compiler, which allows programs to run faster. So many students have also heard about or learned Python, which is another very common programming language. Python is really popular. Many students choose to learn on Python. An advantage of Python is it requires less written code than C++. So if there's less code, there's less to debug, and so potentially fewer mistakes. Python is also easier to use in programming interviews because you have less code to write. And Python is also very good for small projects where you don't need to be super fast or super efficient. The reason why Python is slower than C++ is because Python has to be interpreted by the computer as it runs. It's not compiled in the way that C++ is. One of the big reasons we choose not to use Python in this course are these last two bullets. Python is not as efficient with memory management 
And because Python does not have compilers and memory management, it's a little bit less ideal to learn on because we want you to know about compilers, memory management, and some of these other features. So certainly if you know both Python and C++, all the power to you. You know, that will make you more attractive to employers and help your career. But in this class, we're just going to focus on C++. Okay, fine. So, you know, we, we just introduced C++ and Python. That's great. Why are we talking about hardware today? Well, it turns out that understanding how hardware works will help us better understand how to communicate with software. We need to know our audience, right? So we'll just briefly introduce some key concepts from computer hardware, and this will help us better see how programming languages fit in. Okay, so there are five main hardware components. And so we can generally break them down as follows. First, we have our central processing unit, or CPU. And that's basically the brains of the computer. That's what's doing all the thinking, all the heavy lifting, and the calculations. Next, we have the main memory, or RAM. That's where the program that is currently running is stored. So main memory. Next, we have our secondary memory, or secondary storage devices. These are like our USB drives, our hard drive space, floppy disks back in the day. That is extra storage for secondary memory. And then of course we have our input and output devices. So input devices being our keyboard, mouse, camera, scanner, and our output devices being things like our monitor, printer, and audio. So this table basically summarizes the key things that you should know about hardware for this class. So as we see in the table, the CPU has two main parts. We have the control unit. That's the part that actually receives the instructions from our programs. And it also kind of coordinates the rest of the computer, sort of divide and conquer with the tasks. Then there's also this arithmetic or logic unit, and that's the part of the CPU that crunches the numbers. Interestingly, the CPU can only solve true, false, or yes, no type calculations. So if we want to make it do anything more complex than that, we might need to do some special things to our programs, which we'll learn about a little later. Next is our main memory. Main memory is where programs are stored during execution. So we need to have this main memory, or RAM, in order for our programs to run. We say that main memory is volatile. What we mean by volatile is that this memory is erased when the computer is turned off. Next, secondary storage. This is where we save our data when the programs are not running. Think of data files on your computer. So these files are non-volatile because even after we end our program, even after we turn off our computer, that data is still there. So the data is still saved even after our program ends or even after we power off. Lastly, we have our input and output devices. So once again, these are the devices that send information either into or out of our computer. Please make sure you know these key points. This is all that you'll need to know about these hardware components for the purposes of our class.
Okay, a little bit more about the main memory. So the main memory, or RAM, is organized as follows. So we have our main memory here. So bits are the smallest pieces of memory. And they have a value of either 0 for off or false, or 1 for on or true. And a byte is 8 consecutive bits. You may see memory given in units of kilobytes or megabytes. You know, again, that is how many sets of 8 consecutive bits you have. The thing that's special about bytes is that they have what's called an address. Addresses are important because that tells you in the memory where that byte is located. So this unique number or memory address tells us where that data is stored in the memory. So we're going to revisit these terms in greater detail later on in the course. So stay tuned and you'll see that memory addresses are actually very important. So quick question then. So if we need to have a computer that can run many programs simultaneously, what type of memory would we want to maximize? Would we want to maximize our RAM or the secondary memory, like our hard drive? Take a moment, think about it, and then we'll discuss. All right, so if you were thinking main memory or RAM, you would be correct. If you've done any sort of laptop shopping or looked in computer specs, you may see that often having a high amount of RAM is very desirable in order to be able to run you know, heavy duty programs or lots of gaming or CAD, other demanding programs require a lot of RAM. All right, so key takeaways for memory. When a program is running, it uses main memory, also known as RAM, and RAM is fast. The thing that's nice about RAM is we can access the data quickly and directly. That's RAM, again, stands for random access memory, so that allows us to directly access a given location. Also, programs can refer to files stored on the hard disk or secondary storage. But the thing to note about secondary storage is it is slower than RAM. The reason why is we have to search items in order. So we can't just jump directly to the thing we're looking for. We have to flip through one item at a time until we find what we want. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next topic, which is intro to programming. And again, if you have any questions about what we covered so far, feel free to reach out. So question for everyone. Do you know these people? We have Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. These names ring any bells for you? Well, you might remember Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. They are actually credited with being some of the first people who worked on computers. So Ada Lovelace is actually considered to be one of the first programmers. And Charles Babbage is credited with designing and developing the first computer. So you don't need to know these details for this class, but Good to know. So a couple definitions you do want to know are the simple definitions of computers and programs. So we officially define a computer as a programmable machine designed to follow instructions. And a program is a set of instructions that the computer follows to perform a task. Programmer is the person who writes the instructions in order to perform that task. And so, of course, without programs, a computer cannot do anything.
couple other definitions to know. Software. Software is all the programs that run on a computer. And these fall into two main categories. The system software is the stuff that manages the hardware. So these are things like your operating system and your software development tools. These are programs that manage our hardware and software to make our lives easier. Next, we have application software. This is the fun stuff. These are the programs that provide services to us. So they could be our word processing, internet browser, video games, kind of the fun stuff that we often like to use computers for. Couple other terms. When writing programs, it's a best practice to start by writing an algorithm. You may have heard this term before. An algorithm is a set of well-defined steps or a plan on how to write a program. We'll talk more about algorithms a bit more in our next video. Next, we have machine language. These are instructions written as binary numbers. Binary numbers being a zero or a one. So for example, some set of zeros and ones. And th these machine language instructions are actually something that can be directly read by the CPU. And so you can see just a bit of trivia here, these sort of punch card things. Turns out that Ada Augusta and Charles Babbage, they had to talk to computers using machine language. And so they actually would use these punch cards and punch little holes in the card in order to talk to their computers. And many of the early computers actually required these punch cards in order to perform tasks. All right, so I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to use punch cards in order to talk to my computer. And so thankfully, Grace Hopper came along. You may have heard of Grace Hopper. So she is credited with inventing programming languages. So rather than having to use punch cards and machine language to talk to programs and to talk to computers, we created these sort of high-level programming languages. And so basically the difference here is that a high-level programming language is closer to human language. These are things like C++ or Python, where we write programs using words and symbols that we understand. However, the high-level must be converted into that low-level programming language. So low-level programming languages are used to communicate directly with computer hardware. So these are often written in zeros and ones to talk directly to the computer. So high-level stuff that we can understand using words and symbols closer to English, whereas low-level is communicating directly with hardware. So here's a question then. If our CPU speaks machine language, remember this is binary, or zeros and ones, but we want to write our programs in some other language, like C++, how do we translate between binary and C++? How can we translate our code into instructions that the CPU can understand? Well, if you are thinking about using a compiler or some other program, you're on the right track. Here's how we do it in C++. So first what we do is we write what's called source code. 
you know, if you've heard of an open source program, that's exactly what this is referring to. So initially, up here, we write our C++ source code. For example, when you write a programming assignment for this class, you're writing up your source code. This is done using a text editor as part of often an integrated development environment that we'll cover in a moment. So we have our source code, but the CPU cannot read. The CPU can't understand that source code. In order for the CPU to understand, we have to convert it to an executable file. So to do that, we actually have to take our source code and process it using a few different steps. So these are kind of summarized here. We first do some pre-processing, and so that will add some other, some other statements to our source code and uh, do some initial modification of our file. And then we have the compiler, and that actually converts our source code into machine instructions. And then finally, depending on what kind of hardware we're working with, if it's like a PC or Arduino or smartphone, depending on what we're dealing with, we also may need to use a linker to connect some hardware specific code to our program. And so we also run our code through a linker and that will finally produce the executable file that we need in order for the CPU to run our program. And if there's any error in any one of these steps, then this entire process is stopped. Often we run into errors during compiling because the compiler will detect that something is not quite right with our code. Well, I don't know about you, but I personally would rather not want to need, you know, preprocessor, compiler, linker. You know, this is a lot of programs to have to use in order to write a program. So typically what programmers actually do is they use what's called an integrated development environment, or IDE. And so the IDE actually combines all the tools we have on the previous slide into a single program. So we have a text editor where we actually write our code for step one. And then the IDE will perform the other steps for us in order to produce the executable file. And so there's many IDEs out there that, that people use for programming. In this class, we'll use CLion which is an IDE specifically for C++. You may have also heard of Microsoft Visual C++, Visual Studio Code, Xcode, lots of different IDEs out there. Another very important thing that is used in industry and in this class is called a repository. A repository contains all a program's files and the revision history. So if you ever write a program as the member of a team in industry, you will use a repository all the time. This is a way for programmers to track and save and store all the files associated with the program. Often in hardware engineering, we also use repositories to store specs and drawings and design files for hardware. Very similar idea with a software repository. And you can imagine this is incredibly useful if you have a big team working on the program or if you're making a lot of changes because the repository will contain all your files in one spot and the revision history. So it's a lot easier to collaborate on a program. In this class, we'll be using GitHub, which is actually an online cloud-based repository. And we'll see that it has many advantages for our specific 
use. So in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to use our CLion IDE together with GitHub. And so CLion is the IDE that we install on our computer. So we put CLion on our computer. But then we connect via the internet. and we talk to GitHub in the cloud. And what we do is we can store our programs in GitHub. And you'll see what we can do is by connecting to GitHub, we can, we can take our files from GitHub, put them on our computer, make changes, complete our assignments, and when we're ready, we send them back to GitHub for storage, revision control, and for our class, auto grading. This process is actually very similar to what is actually used in industry in order to work on programs. If you're a programmer or engineer in industry, you may be doing the exact same thing to modify and update shared files with your team. So here's the advantages of using this approach. First, by using GitHub, I've set up the assignments such that they're auto-graded. So you can immediately see your score and you have unlimited attempts to resubmit your assignment until you get the score you want. So you have unlimited attempts before the due date. Of course, my recommendation is that if you submit and you're not sure why you're seeing an error, of course, I recommend that you reach out for help if you've been stuck for a little while. Of course, I do not want anybody to be stuck for hours and hours on an assignment. So highly encourage asking for help. But the goal with the auto grading is so that you immediately know whether or not you did that part of the program correctly and you can use that rapid feedback to help you learn. So auto grading is very helpful. Next is version control. If needed, you can access prior versions of your code. If your computer crashes or if your laptop gets lost or stolen, you still have your latest version in GitHub in the cloud. So it's great to have as a backup. Also, this is really good for your career. If you go into software or hardware, you're probably going to need to use repositories in the future. So this is excellent practice. You can put this on your resume as a really good skill that you have learned. And once again, down here, you can just sort of see an example of how this whole process works. We'll cover this more in detail in our first assignment. But essentially, you see what we do is we can write our code on our computer. We do what's called commit to save a local copy on our computer. And then when we're ready, we can push our assignment file to GitHub. So pushing sends the updated file to GitHub. And you can see that our files are stored in the cloud, they will be auto-graded, and you can easily keep track of the different versions. All right, so if you do have any questions on the topics we've covered so far, feel free to reach out. Next, let's go ahead and introduce C++. So where did C++ come from? So C++ was actually derived from the C programming language. And a lot of people ask, well, why the plus plus? So it turns out programmers often have a sense of humor. We're going to learn in this class that plus plus is actually an operator that means plus one. 
So the people who developed C++ thought it would be funny to call C++ C++1 because it's the next version or an improved version of this C programming language. Kind of like, you know, having a cheesy movie sequel. You know, you, you have number two, number three, number four. In this case, C++ means C plus one. So a little bit of history. Uh, so again, C++ was developed by some folks at AT&T Bell Labs in the 1970s. Or I'm sorry, C was developed in the 1970s. And it was used to maintain a lot of the early Unix systems. And many initial programs applications were written in C. And then C++ came around in the 1980s. And one of the big things that C++ did is it added object-oriented programming capabilities to the C programming language. And believe it or not, there are still bits and pieces of the C programming language within C++. And we may touch on some of those a little bit later. But really, the key takeaway here is that even though C++ is an old programming language, it's still very useful. And most commonly, we use C++ in hardware programming when we need to manage memory directly and when we need things to be very fast. So let's briefly talk about a different analogy here. Suppose we're building something with Lego bricks. And you want to build something new. So what's your most efficient option? Would the more efficient option be to melt your existing Lego bricks? You know, turn them into a liquid plastic and then remake completely new bricks? Or would it make more sense to just take apart the Lego bricks and recombine the existing bricks? Hopefully, you're thinking that option B, recombining, would be the best choice. The nice thing about Legos is that they don't need to be melted down. They're modular pieces, and we can take them apart and recombine them in many different ways. And object-oriented programming is kind of similar. It allows us to build these programs, which are modular pieces. And we use these things called objects, which contain both data and functions bundled together. And object-oriented programming is a tool that lets us basically Lego together our programs from many individual pieces. This allows us to be a lot more efficient and make programs which are very powerful. This is not to say object-oriented programming is the only way to program, but we'll see later on that it can be a very powerful tool. And this is one of the main reasons why C++ was developed from the C language. So key takeaway here, object-oriented programming allows us to build programs using modular pieces or objects. And we'll revisit what these are a little later in the class. All right, so just a couple more key terms for everyone. So first key term here is procedural programming. In procedural programming, the focus is on processing data. And so basically we have a whole bunch of data we wanna process and we write these functions in order to process data.
So procedural programming is still a very good approach for many kinds of programs. But as we mentioned, there's also this other approach called object-oriented programming, where objects contain data and functions combined together. And we'll learn a little bit more about how this allows us to build modular programs. But for now, just remember the key differences between these terms. And by the end of the class, you'll have a good understanding of which one is which and when you may want to use one over the other. All right, so let's go ahead and end with a preview of what a C++ program actually looks like. And in our next class, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into these terms, but here, let's just start with a preview. You'll see that a typical C++ program looks very similar to this one. We first have these things, often we call them include statements or preprocessor directives. And this basically tells the compiler to add some extra files to our program. In this case, we are asking the program to include IO stream. And this is a capability to use inputs and outputs. This is required to use the commands CN and COUT, which we'll cover in the next class. Next, we have these using statements. This is specifically using a standard namespace for the purposes of our class. We almost always include this statement, but uh, in industry or other places, you may use other kinds of namespaces as well. We'll cover those in more detail later on. Next, we have a main function. So that is this thing here. Every program must contain a main function. And We'll talk more about what functions actually are and why we use these braces and things. But for now, you'll just want to remember that every program must contain this main function. So we have to have int main and the curly braces just like this. Inside the main function, that's where we put the things that the program needs to do. In this case, we're simply outputting hello world to the screen. And this backslash n will add a new line, basically the same as pressing the enter key at the end of your statement. Finally, the return zero tells the function to end and send back essentially an error code zero. We often use these sorts of codes to help debug or design programs to be testable. But for the purpose of our class, we always use return zero here to just let our compiler know that everything ran successfully. And finally, you'll notice a few extra things about this program. Notice the use of semicolons. You'll see that every statement in the C++ program needed to end in a semicolon. And our functions were enclosed in curly braces. So in our next video, we'll dive in deeper to these good practices, and we'll start writing some simple programs of our own. So let's summarize for today. So hopefully now you're able to identify and describe the main parts of computers and their functions. Also make sure you understand the importance of programming languages. 
and those basic terms we covered, like high-level, low-level languages, and why we choose to learn C++. Also, make sure you recognize those tools that programmers use, including IDEs and the GitHub repository. You'll see that we're going to be using them a lot in this class. And finally, make sure you understand kind of the key advantages of C++ and the differences between object-oriented and procedural programming. Thanks, everyone, for joining the fun, and we will jump more into programming in our next video. We'll see you then.